For this first episode, let's talk about a guy named Richard Strauss. You've probably heard of him, and if you haven't, you've definitely heard his music. A really famous example comes from the timeless classic of sci-fi, 2001 Space Odyssey. Go something like this. they also used it in the first Toy Story movie, which makes it even more epic. Strauss was something of an innovator with music, and he definitely liked to push boundaries. A really good example of this is his opera Zalame, which follows the story of Salome from the Bible, and for the time, it was about as crazy as you could get. There's actually a scene in it he wrote called the Dance of the Seven Veils where the singer strips down completely naked on stage. And this debuted in 1905. <laughs> I mean, your grandparents were too, probably too young to have seen this. Maybe your great-grandparents could have seen this. And that's a weird image. And they think we're the lost generation. While his subject matter was crazy and new, his musical style was also pushing the boundaries. And I'm not going to talk a lot about music theory on this channel because quite frankly most of you probably won't understand it and you just get really bored with me. But suffice to say, it contributed to the death of tonality, which is where that big separation between pop music and classical music happened in the 20th century. Now onto some juicy gossip from his life. This is actually a pretty well-timed video because um, yesterday was Yom HaShoah, which is the Holocaust Remembrance Day, and our story has to deal with Nazi Germany. In 1933, when Strauss was already 68 years old and getting to that old crotchety point in his life, the Nazi party rose to power in Germany. And along with every other German at the time, Strauss was super hopeful that Hitler was going to do amazing things for German music and society. And he kind of started out that way, because I don't know if you know this, but Hitler was an artist. Um, not a particularly good one, but, you know, he tried. In fact, Hitler loved Strauss because of Salome. He saw it a few times, and I guess he really, really liked the Dance of the Seven Veils. Strauss and Hitler's relationship turned sour when Hitler started going after the Jewish people. Strauss's daughter-in-law and grandchildren were all Jewish, and so he got super pissed when Hitler started banning performances of Jewish music. And since Strauss really didn't give a crap about what anyone thought about him, he started to say some pretty saucy things about the Nazi party. <laughs> An example is, I consider the Teiche Gerber's Jew baiting as a disgrace to German honor, as evidence of incompetence, the basest weapon of untalented, lazy mediocrity against a higher intelligence and greater talent. Woof. He was also known to refer to Goebbels, who was in charge of the Ministry of Propaganda, as a pipsqueak. And as you can guess, Goebbels didn't really like that so much. And he had some not nice things to say about Strauss either, including, Unfortunately, we still need him, but one day we shall have our own music, and then we shall have no further need of this decadent neurotic. This nasty diatribe culminated 
1935 when Strauss decided to collaborate with a Jewish librettist named Stefan Zweig. And he demanded that Zweig's name appear on the marquee, and even wrote Zweig a letter that was intercepted by the Gestapo. In his letter, he raised a few interesting points about how composers compose. For example, Do you believe I am ever, in any of my actions, guided by the thought that I am German? Do you suppose Mozart was consciously Aryan when he composed? I recognize only two types of people, those who have talent and those who have none. As you can guess, Hitler wasn't too happy about the contents of that letter, so he had Strauss fired from his position and tried to make Strauss's life a living hell. Luckily, Strauss was able to use his influence with party members to secure safety for his Jewish family. And in 1942, Strauss and his family managed to escape Germany and they moved to Vienna where they were able to safely survive World War II. Anyway, Strauss and his family survived World War II, and afterwards he actually wrote one of his most famous and gorgeous works ever, um, a song cycle of four songs called The Last Four Songs for soprano and orchestra. And if you ever want to hear something that makes your heart melt, that's something you should listen to. Well, this was really fun, guys. And, you know, let me know what you think about this. Um, and if you have any recommendations for music history lessons or anything that we can discuss, uh, feel free to shoot it my way. And um, until next time. Musicology.